yes, Australia. Um, and there I met uh, this Australian. And I'm not going to apologise for bringing an Australian to a summit. Because these poor Australians, you know what happens? They don't even know how much we dislike them. <laughs> they have no idea. I was, sitting in a, uh, I was sitting in a pub uh, in Melbourne, talking to this guy, watching football, uh, Aussie, Aussie rules, we're talking about rivalry, and the conversation turns around, he's like, so who does South Africa hate? And I'm like, hmm, I hate to tell you this, buddy, <laughs> but it's Australia. But I know that you are in very safe hands with this particular Australian this morning. So I'd like to introduce you this morning's keynote, Chris Betcher. He is the program manager for G Suite Adoption in Google Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm South African welcome to Chris Betcher. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, yes, yeah, so we were sitting yesterday and I, I said to Lindsay, is there anything I should know culturally about, you know, talking to a bunch of South Africans? And she said, yeah, we don't like Australians very much. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, so I made the long trip here uh, just the other day from Sydney, flew across to Perth, from Perth then flew the long trip 11 hours right across the Indian Ocean uh, to Joburg and then, of course, down to uh, Cape Town. So that's how I got here. Um, has anyone been to Australia? Oh, fantastic. The nice thing about Australia is, um, you know, we have a national airline. I don't know if you can see there, that's just literally a snake on a plane. Because in Australia, everything will kill you. And, and uh, you know, we had... I, I just thought I'd share a couple of little photos here. This is after some floods up in Townsville. The crocodiles came out on the rivers. Uh, if they don't get you, the stingers will. Uh, and <laughs> I, I don't know what scares me more, the dingo or the half-eaten shark. Uh, and if all that fails, you can probably die just falling off a cliff. So, you know, this message brought to you by tourists in Australia. <laughs> oh dear. So, I'm here to talk to you this morning about a few things uh, that I hope will both inspire you and challenge you. One of the, one of the most best compliments I've ever received about giving this particular talk is a guy tweeted me afterwards and he said, you made me simultaneously angry and inspired. So I hope I kind of do that to you today. Um, this is me and my mum. I am 56 years old and I've been teaching for about 30 years. I was originally an art teacher and I kind of drifted from art into multimedia and design and computing and network management and all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, 30 years in the classroom uh, and then I left the classroom a couple of years ago to work with EdTech team. I worked with them for a while and just uh, about three weeks ago I started with Google. So I, um, I now have a Google email address. I'm very excited about that. Um, that's my mum. My mum is also a teacher. She taught for over 40 years. She won all these sorts of awards and was recognised as a great teacher when she retired. Um, so we've, we both share a lot uh, about our teaching lives. And I remember when I first started teaching. Does anyone remember your first year of teaching? Was it terribly difficult? I, I used to go to school and I'd try and teach I would literally come home and cry and go, what am I doing wrong, Mum? Why do they hate me so much? And, and she'd console me. And so, you know, that first year of teaching is really hard, right? But I look at the school, that, uh, the, school, the school experience that I've lived the last few years versus the one that my mother lived when she was teaching, it's like unrecognisable. We walk into classrooms and kids have devices. Um, this is like, I'm teaching a kindergarten, sorry, not kindergarten, year one class here, how to write music in Soundtrap. Uh, here is like, take your students to think places like Google or Adobe and get that sort of industry experience. This was not the education system my mother grew up with. Things have changed a lot. Right? And so I just want to muse on a couple of these ideas about how much education's changed, which I think you know, right? But also a little bit about what that means. What, what's the implication of that for us? So a little quiz for you here. Um, let's play a game. There are six photographs for you. Each one comes from a different decade. I just want you to turn to the person next to you. I'll give you 30 seconds. See if you can put them in chronological order, or at least, sorry, identify which picture belongs to which decade. Go, 30 seconds. Pretty confident that you can identify all the decades. 
Interesting. Would you like to see the answers? Okay, th these are the answers. Did anyone get it right? One person, congratulations sir. I have to tell you, I've shown this particular little question to probably thousands of teachers all around the world over the last couple of years, and you're probably about the fourth person to actually say they get it right. So well done. Now, why is it so hard? Why is it that I can go to a room full of professional educators, because that's what we do, right? And this is our business, and yet even we have trouble figuring out how those timelines have sort of changed over the years. Why is that, do you think? I think that's absolutely true. And you notice it goes from here to the 1920s to the 1970s, right? So over that particular period, you're right, there was not a lot of change. And it actually becomes really hard. How many of you had to, like, to work that out, you literally had to look at hairstyles and fashion? Yeah. yeah. Right. So it wasn't the classroom that was the differentiator, it was just the things around the classroom, like fashion, right? Now, something very interesting happened after the 1970s. In the 1980s, something came along. It was this thing. The personal computer. And I'm looking around the room, there's probably a few people in here who were old enough to remember those days. In the 1980s, the personal computer appeared. For those that aren't old enough, you're just going to have to listen to this old guy telling stories now, right? <laughs> the computer appeared. And I don't know about you, but I got excited by that. When the computer first appeared, not in the classroom, but just as a general thing in the world, personal computers appeared. My question was, wow, imagine the possibilities. What could I do with that? And I had no idea what the answer to that question was, by the way. But I just thought, oh, I'm just imagining what I could do with this. Oh, and I had all these ideas, and like some of them you know, turned out to be practical, and some of them didn't. But imagine the possibilities. Now, I don't know if you remember back to the 1980s, some of you would, um, to when personal computers came out. This was kind of one of the very first popular ones, Commodore 64. Did anyone have a Commodore 64? Oh, look at a few hands going up, okay. So that was the Commodore 64. Anyone in this room who's sort of under 25 is going, what is going on now? <laughs> but that was, that was one of the first popular computers when they first appeared. And, and people were looking at this and going, wow, imagine the possibilities. What could we do with that? And then uh, that was my first computer. It was a Commodore PET. It had a tape drive. That's a cassette tape in the front there. That's how you loaded things, right? And, and of course, if you've been around for a while, you probably remember these, right? Yeah, they were a classic. Um, now, of course, we live in this world now where students have the most amazing devices. They have their iPads and their iPhones and their Macs and they're like high-end. These are pixel books here. And we live in this amazing world where the technology you have now is just incredible. And you have to remind yourself sometimes that this is the worst technology your students will ever use. Let that just sink in for a second. This is the Commodore 64 of their generation, right? And just like when, when, the, when the Commodore 64 or the Apple IIe was around and we thought, wow, this thing's amazing, right? And now we look at it and go, how quaint it is. And it's going to be the same with this stuff. It's just one of those things that's just changing constantly. And we've got to remind ourselves of that because it's, it's, it's a profound understanding when you realize that. Now, in the 1990s, something else came along that changed the landscape a lot as well. Does anyone want to guess what that is? It was the internet. I distinctly remember when I first heard about the internet. I was teaching in a school, it was like 1993 or something like that, and I, I, I'd heard the word but didn't know what it meant, and I found a magazine, and in this magazine, it was probably Wired magazine, and it said, the internet is not an island of information, it's the ocean. And I just went, oh, I got shivers about that. Imagine the possibilities. I don't know what that means, but I was excited by it, right? And I went to my principal and I said, can we have the internet? And he said, and he said, what is that? And I went, I don't know, but it sounds really exciting. And I think we can do things with it. And he said, well, what do we need to get the internet? I said, well, no, this is dial-up internet, remember? Yeah, all the sounds, right? I can almost sing that. Um, so I went to the principal and I said, I need the internet in my classroom. And I, I could kind of talk this guy into things, you know, and he, he kind of went, well, what do we need? I said, I need a phone line in my classroom. And he went, I'm not putting a phone line in a classroom. I went, but I need one for my internet. And uh, he said, well, all right then, how much is it going to cost? 
So I told him the cost of putting a phone line in, and, and he said, I, and I went, but uh, there's also the cost of digging the trench to get, to get from the street to my classroom. And he said, I'm not paying for that, that's too expensive. So on Saturday morning, I went in and I dug the trench. <laughs> And I literally got a hoe and a shovel and I dug the trench from the front of the school all the way to my classroom and on Monday morning Telstra came along and laid the line and I had a telephone line in my classroom and I was so excited by that, right? And, and I'm, I'm here, I'm like, imagine the possibilities, what can I do? I have this whole world of information now in my classroom, I was so excited about that. Now, if you think how much the world has changed since you were at school, and everyone here is different ages, so like, just think about how much the world's changed since you were at school. And just to sort of put a number on it, I'm just going to say, let's say the 1990s, right? Since the 1990s, all of these things have come into existence. None of those things existed before 1990. Now, put your hand up if you remember the 90s. Put your hand up if you'd rather forget the 90s. <laughs> All of those things existed. If you said the word Wikipedia, someone would go, I don't have no idea what you're talking about. Selfie, World Wide Web, all of these words, all of these ideas, all these technologies, they all came about in the very short period of time since most of us in this room were at school. That's phenomenal. Now, all of those things exist because someone somewhere decided to imagine the possibilities to bring into existence something that didn't exist before based on new technologies, new ideas that were now available. Now, new technologies is an interesting idea. This is Douglas Adams. Uh, he's, he was the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, one of my favorite authors. Um, and Douglas Adams once wrote this about technology. He said, I've come up with a set of rules that describe our reactions to technology. He said, first of all, anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and just a natural part of the world, way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. Imagine the possibilities. Anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. <laughs> And it's an interesting idea, I think, because, you know, it raises this, this phrase that you might have heard before, that when something challenges your perceptions of how, how the world's always been and something new comes along and you're kind of a little bit, oh, I'm not sure about this, this thing, that's the way we've always done it. Now, you don't hear people say that necessarily, but you often hear them say things like this. They say things like, well, it's just not how we do it around here, or, you know, we tried that once before and it didn't work, or we just like things the way they are. You, you, have you ever heard anyone say these things? Yeah. Okay. What they're really saying, though, is that. That's the way we've always done it. Please don't rock the boat, right? So, I just want to talk about a few of those things for a second. So, this idea of the future. I saw this, the HSBC used to have these posters all over airports all over the world at one stage and, um, and I kind of like that one, in the future even the smallest businesses will be multinational and you've got the, uh, the lemonade stand there operating in three currencies. Because like it's such a different world, it's not, it's not the world we grew up in. Like. And so um, if you think about the future, do you remember these guys? Remember the Jetsons? Right? Hands up if you remember the Jetsons. Oh, okay, good. I was worried. Oh, we have some sound on this, Mr. Soundman. If you could turn that up just a tad. I think. It's supposed to be sound. Anyway, so that's the Jetsons. You remember the Jetsons? They did all their, their stuff. I, I was doing a little bit of research looking at the Jetsons, and I discovered that these are a whole bunch of technologies that they spoke about in that cartoon that at the time seemed like far-fetched and revolutionary video chat. Remember when George would have a video chat with his boss, Mr. Spacely? And now we do video chats all the time, that's just normal. They had a thing called the RUDI, the Referential Universal Digital Indexer. It was like a screen you could go to and look up any information about anything in the world. Sound familiar? And things like the Televiewer or, or this idea that pushing buttons could be work. Right? That was such a strange idea back in the 50s when this show was built. Uh, having a robot housekeeper. Who's got a Roomba that goes around and cleans their floor? Anyone? Right? Or, or you know, moving walkways. They're everywhere now. The three hour work week. It's not unusual. I know people who don't work a full week. They, they work much less than that. George Jetson used to work three days a week. But flying cars. Fly, we still don't have our flying cars, do we? 
And it's interesting, if you go back to 1958, Ford actually had some ideas for the flying car. Uh, it was called the Ford Volante. It was the, the uh, flying car of the future they pitched it as. Uh, I can remember being a kid, I had books about cars, and it started with the Model T Ford, and it had all these different cars. I got to the last page, and it would be, there was a picture of this. And I, as a kid, I'm thinking, oh, imagine the possibilities of a flying car. That's so exciting. We still don't have a flying car. And it's interesting, because if you go back to the Jetsons again, and you sort of look at, George had a flying car. Do I need to turn that volume up a bit? At my end? Oh, there we go. What did George do with his flying car? He drove it to work. Stop and think about that for a second. He drove it to work. We invent this amazing new technology and all we do with it is just do what we've always done with it. And that idea, if you've heard of the SAMA model, Anyone? Just a show of hands if you've heard of the Salmon Model. It's quite a few people. Salmon Model talks about this idea of using technology to just substitute things you've always done, all the way up to do, redefining what we do with, with technology, so doing completely new things. If you think about it, that, that top level there, redefinition, that's really doing cool, interesting stuff that can't be done with existing tools, and that's driving a flying car to work. Right? If, if all we do with our technology is like give up digital worksheets, then it's like having a flying car and you, all you do is drive it to work. Right? It's not really taking advantage of the fact that you've got technology. So what is the point of all this technology stuff then? Why do we have it? Why do we pay millions of dollars to bring technology into our schools? Why have we invested so much time and energy into training and everything else over the years? Does it really make any difference? Well, I just want to tell you a little story about something that happened to me. Uh, it's a number of years ago now, but this was the turning point in my career. This was the thing, ultimately, that kept me teaching. After those first few difficult years of going home and crying to my mother and saying, why is this so hard, right? And then I, I got struggled through and I, I thought I got better at teaching, but it wasn't until this experience that I suddenly discovered teaching. And as Lindsay said this morning, the heart of a teacher, you know? So this is a photo of, there's me at the back there, this is um, a couple of other teachers here and a group of students. Those students were some from Australia, some from the US, some from Japan. And we entered a internet competition in 1999. Um, and we actually won. And this is the team, that we were flown to Hong Kong to collect a prize. It was sponsored by uh, AT&T, right? Um, but I just want to take you back a little bit. So this is a group of students that we're working with. So this is 1999, so technically this is not 21st century education, right? Um, and we're gathered around a computer there, and we're having a video conference with some students in Japan. Right? Because the idea of this, uh, this competition that the kids were in was they had to come up with an idea for building a website. They had to collaborate with teams from around the world. So there was 300 schools involved in 100 teams. Each team had three schools. The rule was that the three schools had to be on three different continents. Right? So we were teamed up with the US, with Japan, and us in Australia. And um, so we're having this video call. And uh, so you can see at the top there, it's not like Hangouts or... Um, or iChat or something now, it's like it's very grainy and blurry and it was, it was hard to set up. And, but it was, we could do it, it was just a little bit tricky. And you can see we're having a conversation here in the chat at the bottom and you know, the students are talking back, to, back and forth to each other. And I, I remember this bit particularly, this morning that we had, came in for this particular call, um, and they were talking about making a video together and they were, they were figuring out how you could do that. And I remember the question that started that was, um, you know, can, can you do video editing? Oh, oh, there it is. There. Are you able to edit digital video? That's what my students said. And then the Japanese student said, oh, we can, probably. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, I like that sort of go spirit. So they were chatting back and forth about video. I don't know if you remember how hard it was to make video a few years back, especially across the internet. You had to literally record it on these things, tapes, what? What are tapes? Right? You record it on tapes, and then if you wanted to collaborate, you'd stick it in an airmail envelope, and you'd mail the tape to your partner, and they would do something with it, and then mail it back to you, and it was literally, that's how it worked. Nowadays, of course, you just upload it, and people download it, and edit it, and it's much easier. But, you know, again, how much has technology changed in this regard? This is the digital camera I bought for that project. Did anyone ever have one of these? This was like the super duper, this, if you had one of these. And you could take as many photos as you wanted, as long as they were 640 by 480, like real high resolution. Right, you take as many photos as you wanted, as long as you had an unlimited supply of these things, because that was the film, right? Nowadays, kids look at those things and go, what are they exactly? 
Even in Microsoft Word, they still use that icon. What is that? Most people have not touched a floppy disk for a decade, and we still have the floppy disk icon as the save icon. You go to your students and you say to them, where's the save button? They'll point to it, and then you say, what's it, what's it a picture of? And they'll go, well, I don't know. <laughs> Why do they do that? Because that's the way we've always done it. Because at one point, a floppy disk was a good symbol for saving something. It's not anymore, but we keep doing it anyway because that's the way we've always done it, right? Um, if you look at your mobile phone, you've probably got a button like that on it somewhere, but you don't use those, <laughs> right? But that's the way we've always done it. And just for fun, uh, if you're old enough, you remember the relationship between these two things. <laughs> All the young people in the room are going, what's happening? <laughs> All right. So anyway, so my students went in this competition. And this, we actually did it three years. The third year we went in it, we actually won it. Um, and we got flown to Hong Kong. The, the year we won it, um, they designed a website. Uh, well, actually, just to backtrack, the, the year before, the, the second time we did it, uh, we placed third. And I'm talking third in the world, right? I don't know if you know what kind of students get involved in internet design competitions. This is not your sports kids, right? <laughs> this is not the popular kids in the school always. They're, some, they're the nerdy kids who have quirky habits and strange friends, right? <laughs> and they, were, they, they won this thing and they were the third best in the world at something. And for a lot of those kids, that's the first time they've won an award for anything, right? And um, so they won this award uh, the year before, coming third. And they said, Mr. Betcher, can we do this again? Because we want to win it. And I said, OK, let's do it. So they, so they did it again the next year. And they did. They won it. They figured out how to collaborate and how to do all this stuff. That was the important stuff. And so this is them in Hong Kong collecting their prizes. And oh my god, these kids were so nerdy. Like, <laughs> the night before they had their award ceremony, we, st we got to stay in the Marriott Hotel in Hong Kong, which was very nice. right? And we were sitting in the lobby the, the night before. And all the kids were there from all the three different countries. And I walked over and I said, hey, guys, you, you're getting an award tomorrow. Do you have a speech planned? And they went, oh, no. And I said, well, you better, you better write one. You better say something tomorrow when you get this award. And I just left it with them. I wasn't going to sort of help them more than that. And um, I love the last line of the speech was um, this whole event, this whole experience has really put a smile on our faces. And they lift up their smiling faces. <laughs> it was so nerdy. Right? But they wrote this speech, and they wrote it entirely on their own, and they wrote it without any adult supervision. And they asked me to proofread it, and I couldn't hold myself together when I read this speech. It was unbelievable. And I'm just going to share a part of it with you. And the reason I share this speech is because, to me, this became my mantra for what it meant to teach and what it meant to learn. Right? So part of the speech went like this. It said, this project has had an enormous influence on our lives. It has taught us how to be part of a team and how to take our own initiative and achieve our goals. It gave us a worldwide perspective and helped us appreciate our own cultures as well. Having a multicultural team brought us the challenges of language barriers, time zones, different cultural perspectives, but it also brought a broader understanding greater diversity of opinions, and it changed many of our stereotypes. Our countries have gone from being just names on a map to becoming real places with history, heritage, and customs. Plus, we've become friends with people from all over the world. As we worked together, we learned how to accept constructive criticism and how to politely communicate our views about other people's ideas, even when we didn't agree with them. It took the individual talents of everyone in our team, the leaders, the designers, the programmers, the organizers, the musicians, the artists, the writers, the motivators, the stressed and the sane, all woven together to bring our visions to reality. I can still barely read that without it sort of feeling it here, right? And that, that was, that, that's what happened for me in that moment. Just something broke inside me that day when I read that. And it was like, I, I get it. I now know why we teach. I now understand what it's all about. And that list of stuff that they came up with. Now, I just want to put some perspective on this for you. Like, I was the computing studies teacher at this school. I thought it would be great to get involved in this competition because my students would learn something. And they did. But what I thought they would learn is 
how to make a web page, how to do some design, how to use Photoshop, how to upload to a server, blah, 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 blah. I thought they'd learn all that stuff. I was excited because I thought if, if, if I give my kids those skills, I've done a good job. When I read that, and I realized that's what they took away from this. Not all the nerdy stuff that I was hoping they'd learn, that's what they learned about it. They're a very, that's a very human set of skills. It's not how to upload to a web server and how to do Photoshop. It's about being a better human being. And I look at that list of skills and I think, there's some world leaders could learn from that. There's, some, there's some, lots of people in the world who are currently running our world. And I'm not just talking about the obvious one that you're thinking of. Like lots of people in the world, right? who would benefit from a better attitude to this sort of stuff. Imagine what sort of world we could be if we appreciated other cultures as much, or if we could learn to agree without being disagreeable, or we could learn to have tolerance for others and, and not believe in stereotypes. What a better world that would be. So that was a turning point for me as an educator. And nothing was ever the same. Now, after this competition, they also, they also uh, surveyed the teachers that were involved, and they asked the teachers, what did you learn from it? And I thought about it, I thought there were four things. Four things that I learned from that. And the first one was that if you want students to really perform, if you want students to really be their best, first of all, you've got to give them something to care about. And one of the nice things about doing this competition, it was extracurricular. It actually wasn't tied to any curriculum. The students decided what they wanted to learn about. They came up with ideas and stuff that mattered to them. Now, I know that's not entirely practical, for most schools, you can't just throw out the curriculum and not teach it, you have to teach it. But it really made me realise that I have to find more interesting ways to make that curriculum relate to my students so they do care about it. The second thing I learned was I, you have to give students the tools they need. In our case, for this particular thing, getting kids to be able to use tools like real-time chat and video conferencing and web design and all that sort of stuff was fascinating because it it lit these kids' fuses, like that's what they got excited about. And so I let them do it and, and the, the, like it, the passion. By the way, that in interesting, out of that little group of students, I've kind of kept in touch with them over the years. One's worked at Apple, one's worked at Google, one's worked for um, uh, a bunch of companies you probably haven't heard of here, but like big technology companies. One was the multimedia director of Yahoo. Like that little group of kids all went on to have amazing careers in the technology and communication business. And when I've interviewed, I've actually went back and interviewed those kids like 20 years later and I said, what did you learn from that project? And they went, we learned to collaborate, we learned to work with people, we learned to work in teams, right? The stuff they learned from that actually changed their whole career, which I find is fascinating. But you give kids the tools they need, then you give them choices. That last little bit of their speech where it said, like, it took all of our talents, the motivators, the writers, the artists, the stressed and the sane, the, the programmers, all that, like, they knew who they were. There was a kid in that group who was really good at Photoshop. He was really good at making graphics. Guess who got to make most of the graphics? That kid, because he was good at it. And there was another kid who could write a JavaScript thing like you wouldn't believe. Guess who got to write the JavaScript? That kid, because he was good at it. And they figured out, I didn't, I didn't say, okay, you're the JavaScript guy, right? Because they worked that out. So you know, give kids choices. And finally, this was the biggest lesson for me, get out of their way. Right? I think as teachers we kind of micromanage a little bit sometimes and we perhaps um, try and just, just be there too much. And sometimes we have to step back and go, I don't know, you figure it out. Right? Um, and I'll talk more about that in just a sec. So those are the four things. Give them something to care about, give them the tools they need, give them options and get out of their way. That was a huge lesson for me as an educator. I'm just going to show you a little piece of this little video, if we can make sure there's some sound on this. Could you make it better? And what makes things better? Science. Science is in everything and everywhere. So when you take something important to you and mix it with science, amazing things can happen. Mahir made drones fly smarter by imitating the movements of fruit flies. Anne made flashlights shine by using the heat of her own hand. Anarud made vaccine refrigeration possible through the power of pedaling. And now, it's your turn. The Google Science Fair is a chance for curious young minds from all over the globe to use science and engineering to make something stronger or smarter, louder or larger, faster or even slower. So, what will you make better? 
So that's just a little promo video for the Google Science Fair, which is currently on at the moment, in case you haven't heard of it or you'd like to know more about it, just Google, Google Science Fair. Um, but it's a, it's a, again, it's a global competition for students to do science projects. And you see the stuff that comes out of that. I mean, there was a kid who designed that thing for keeping vaccines cold in places where that's a hard problem. Um, the kid who came up with the idea of a flashlight, that when you hold the flashlight, the heat of your hand actually powers it. But we've had kids come through this program that have literally designed, like, potential cures for cancer. And these are, these are because kids identify a problem. And the last line of that video where she says, what, well, I think it's there, what will you make better? Like, that's a great question. What will you make better? And too often we ask the wrong questions in school, you know? What will you make better? Um, this is a little short part of a video. I'm just going to show you part of it. Just a person in of, um, No steering wheel, no pedal. You've probably heard that Google's working on self-driving cars, right? And you hear that and you go, oh, that's a cool idea, self-driving cars. And you realise this guy's blind. This is not a technology, this is a cool technology for the sake of it. This, this potentially changes people's lives for the better. If you're blind and you've never driven before... For me to be alone in a car. A very important segment of my life was cut away when my vision failed. And a self-driving car would give me a huge part of my life back. This is just the... So... You know, that, that idea about imagining possibilities is thinking about uh, seeing new technologies come along and identifying problems in the world that could be fixed and marrying those two concepts together and solving really big problems is, I think, that's, that's why we're here. That's why we educate, right? Now, um, <laughs> I like this quote from, uh, who was it from? Mark Twain, I think? No, George Bernard Shaw. Uh, the reasonable man. <laughs> Sorry for the sexist language. He said man, so I'll quote it the way he said it, but he means people. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in adapting the world to himself. And therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Right? In other words, if you see something in the world that isn't right, you can either go, oh, well, and, and accept it, or you can go, I'm going to fix that. And fixing it is an unreasonable thing, because you know what happens when you try and make big change. <laughs> like... You get resistance and like it's, it's hard and it's uncomfortable. But if you're going to make progress, you've got to do it. So the progress relies on someone being unreasonable. So that's, you know, you should be unreasonable. You should teach your students to be unreasonable because that's, that's how it changes things. That's how you don't end up in the, that's the way we've always done it thinking. Now, let's just talk about technology for one sec here. The, uh, uh, I think one way to think about technology is it removes friction. And by that I mean this. You've probably seen some of these companies, Uber, Airbnb, Netflix, eHarmony. Well, you think about all those different companies and you think, what, what is it they actually do? Well, they all do something very different, but they have something in common. And what they're doing is they're connecting someone who wants something with someone who's got something. And they're taking the friction out of that process. Think to Netflix, for example. It's, Netflix is in South Africa, right? Yeah. Right, but it's just checking. Just checking. I've been to places in the world where that's not true. Just checking. Um, or, you know, or your Airbnb. Like, if you think about what Netflix does, I'm guessing here in South Africa, before Netflix, you had video stores, right? Just like everywhere else in the world, right? And still have them, right? Okay. And so it's changing, right? So it's changing. In Australia now, you pretty much can't find a video store at all. And in the States, could you back me up here, but basically the video stores are gone, right? Five in the whole country, right? So now why is that? Is it that people, like, why, did, why was Netflix so successful if they were just doing something that was already being done? I mean, you can go and get a video from the video store and bring it home and watch it. You get Netflix, you get a video from Netflix and watch it. Like, functionally, nothing's changed. But now it's what? It's easier, right? It's easier. If you can just make something easier and simpler and more direct, then you completely change the whole thing. You literally kill off one industry while you birth another one. And that's what all of these people do. They, they take something like Uber, someone who's, who can drive you around with someone who needs to be driven around. E-Harmony, someone who wants to meet someone, someone else who wants to meet someone, right? Like, and it, but it takes the friction out of that process and it makes it easy. Now, a couple of famous examples. I mean, I, I'm sure you don't shoot on film anymore. Is that because people don't take us? Like, Kodak is, is basically gone, right? A couple of years ago, Kodak pretty much vanished as a company, even though they've invented photography. Is that because people don't take photos anymore? 
Uh, people take more photos than ever. But what happened? What changed? Uh, digital photography came along. And interestingly, Kodak weren't, uh, Kodak saw this coming, right? If you're standing in the middle of the highway and a truck's coming towards you, you see it coming. And that was Kodak with digital photography coming. And they kind of went, nah, nothing will ever become of that. Why? Because film's the way we've always done it. And of course, you know how that story ended. And then you've got the video store example we talked about. You know, you had video stores and um, you know, suddenly digital downloads became a thing. And it's like, ah, digital downloads, that'll never work, right? And now there's no video stores. And then you've got things like record stores, right? I don't know. I guess they still exist, but, huh? Back in fashion. Back in They are a little bit back in fashion, yeah, in the hipster sort of vibe. Um, but, but there's a lot of people now who the primary way they get their music is either Spotify or you know, Google Play Music or Apple Music or one of those sorts of things. Why? Because it's easier. So it got me thinking, what is the equivalent of that in education? Is there anything happening in the education world at the moment that is also doing the same thing? Is, it, is there something that's taking the friction out of learning in the same way that technology took the friction out of taking photographs or took the friction out of watching videos. And I'm, I'm going to suggest there is. I'm going to suggest that there's a whole bunch of places now that if a student wants to learn, they can do it whether you like it or not. They can go to YouTube. Hands up if you've ever looked up how to do something on YouTube. All right, it's interesting, isn't it? Hands up if YouTube is blocked at your school. Oh, that's encouraging. It's really, it's fascinating. I see, see these schools in Australia and you go like, do you block YouTube? And they all block YouTube. And then you say, but did you ever learn anything on it? And they all did, right? Um, so yeah, lots and lots of places where students can go and learn stuff. Uh, just another little quick clip for you. What's and some sound clips. Glossophobia. All speech anxiety is the fear of public speaking. Now, we are the masters of our fate. Which has been set us is not above our strength, but its pangs and toils are not beyond our endurance. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in, never give in, never, never, never. It's really true that a kid with an curious kid with an internet connection, internet connection can learn anything they want, right, with or without you. That's fascinating, um, and it really is. I think it's kind of this. It's the education equivalent of what happened to photography and video and a whole bunch of other industries, because if we don't adapt to that, and if we don't see that if it's like Kodak standing in the middle of the road watching the truck coming, right? We, we see these changes coming in technology and if we continue to sort of have this, oh, that's the way we've always done it kind of mindset, we're going to end up being the digital photography victims in education, right? So, um, you know, I don't know how kids learn stuff without us, but they do. <laughs> they just follow crazy flowcharts like that. They, they figure it out, right? They just figure out how to do stuff. Um, now, when I say this to teachers about, oh, our kids don't need us anymore, and that's not what I'm saying, by the way. I'm absolutely not saying kids don't need teachers. But when I talk about this sort of stuff, sometimes people go, oh, what are you suggesting? So kids are just going to be taught by robots, right? I discovered you guys call traffic lights robots. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about this idea of um, like robots teaching our kids. That's not what I mean at all. When I say technology is going to sort of come in and change education, it's not teachers are going to be redundant because suddenly machines are going to do our job. Far from it. In fact, you know, this is my little monkey brain thinking about the education process in its simplest possible terms. Here's a teacher, here's a student, right? And the traditional model has been that. The teacher has knowledge and the student assumedly does not, and so we push knowledge to a student as though they're this empty vessel waiting to be filled, right? It's obviously not true, but that's 
kind of how education has been predicated for a long time. And on the other hand, you've got this situation where a student now can go to places like the internet and they can pull things towards them, whatever they want. So they don't need a teacher pushing information to them. They can go and pull anything they want from the internet and learn anything. And so I think it becomes a really interesting situation. Then you've got this student sitting in the middle and they can either have information pushed to them by a teacher or they can have pulled information to them from themselves, from somewhere else to themselves, right? And the, it, it, it's become more and more obvious to me over the last couple of years that what makes a really good teacher is not someone who fights the other stuff. And it's not even someone who's really good at this stuff. It's a teacher who knows when to do that and when to do that. When do, you let, when do you become the one who pushes stuff towards a student? And someone once said to me, like, you know, my kid has to learn algebra. They're not going to probably teach themselves algebra. So maybe there are some things where you, you probably do have to push knowledge to the students. And you probably need to figure out what motivates them and give them the tools they need and give them some choices and all that sort of stuff we talked about before, right, in order to be effective at pushing stuff to students. But there's other times when you just need to go, I'm just going to let you figure that out on your own because the information is out there. Right? And I think for me, that's the mark of a really good teacher, is just knowing when to push and when to back off, right? when to step away. Now, I did some uh, training with some teachers a, a little while ago, um, how to movie making on an iPad. Right? And these teachers had never made a movie before on an iPad. And they came to this workshop with this perception that it was a really, oh, this is hard, movie making is a really hard thing. Um, who's made movies on an iPad before? Okay. When you first did it for the very first time, did, were you kind of a little bit, oh, I think this is going to be difficult? Yeah, some people nodding. So I, I got this group of teachers, I gave them a little lesson on how to, how to make things in iMovie and I sent them off outside to make a movie and then they, they came back and we had a little showing uh, of everyone's movie. And I asked them this question afterwards. I said, tell me, on a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult is it to make a movie? Now remember, there are a bunch of teachers who had never done it before, they were a little bit trepidatious, is that a word, right, about doing it, and they just went and did it and I said, how difficult was it? And they said, oh, this is like 3 out of 10. It was like really easy. And then I asked the second question. I said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult is it to make a good movie? And they went, um, probably more like a 9. And I thought that was fascinating because like how to make a, how, how, like, how hard is it to make a movie? 3 out of 10. How hard is it to make a good movie? 9 out of 10. Six point difference. That whole six point difference is not about technology skills. The people who make good movies don't press the buttons with more finesse. Right? It's not about that. It's about, what is it about? It's about, it's about story, it's about timing, it's about lighting, it's about, um, it's about using video to convey communications, right? All, all of those stuff, that's not, that's not technology skills. That's, again, human skills. Right? And so this idea then, you know, the difference between being able to use technology and, the, and use technology well is a wisdom thing. It's not a technology thing. Right? And so stop and think about that for a second. Here's an easy way to think about it. In, I've never looked through the um, curriculum for South Africa, but I'm guessing it probably has all sorts of verbs that sound like that. Yeah? I, I say that because it's kind of the same everywhere in the world, right? So if I look at your curriculum, it'll, it'll ask you to teach your students things like that. And then you've got this thing on the other side, what I call the nouns, and they're these technology tools, right? And so if I say the, my job today, I'm an English teacher, let's say, and I've got a teaching group of students, and you know, the, the, the syllabus is asking me to give them the skills of persuasion. Could you get a student to create something persuasive with iMovie? Absolutely you could. What about, could they do a Google Slides presentation that could persuade an audience? 100%. What about using GarageBand and doing like a podcast? Right? They're all persuading, but they're all different tools. Another example, what about if our goal was to explain something clearly? Could you use Google Docs to explain something? Sure. You could write a nice essay about it. What about uh, Prezi? Yep, you could do that. What about Adobe Spark? Yep, you could do that. Like, the skill is the verb, not the noun. The verbs aren't going to change an awful lot. We'll still be teaching those verbs in 10 years' time. Most of these things on the right probably won't even remember them in 10 years' time, right? 
And so I think the, the value of that for us then is that this idea that technology is a critically important enabler for learning, but it actually has very little to do with pushing students to excellence. Pushing students to excellence is about great teaching. It probably always has been about great teaching. It probably always will be about great teaching, right? But we also live in this world where technology as an enabler for that is critically important. Does that make sense? So I'm, I'm not sort of saying technology's like this thing we can ignore. We can't. But I'm also not saying technology is the answer either. It has to be married to good pedagogy and good teaching. All right, so let's go back to that list of things we talked about in the beginning. These are all the things that came into the existence of the world after 1990. If I was to remake that list now and say, what are the things in our world now that are our challenges, the things we have to sort of get past, I would probably make the list that looks something like this. I think we have much bigger problems to solve. The fact that we live in a world where we have this you know, climate change issue, that's one problem, but the fact that we have so many people in positions of influence that deny it's real is a problem. The fact that we have, um, you know, deal we're dealing with post-truth media and populist democracies and um, incompetent global leaders. And th these are the big problems that our kids are facing right now. These are the challenges. And you have to ask yourself, you know, that question we say to students, what do you want to be when you grow up? Wrong question. The question is, what problems do you want to fix when you grow up? That's the, that's the question. And so we spend an awful lot of time in education talking, thinking about these questions, like what should be taught? When should it be taught? How should it be structured? Who should pay for it? If you sit in, sit in any sort of leadership meeting in any sort of school, you ask these kind of questions. And sometimes we don't think enough about that question. Why do we teach? Why are we doing this? That's the big question. If we don't get that one right, all the other questions don't matter. So, so these issues that come up. I'm going to let this guy sum it up. This is Professor Klaus Schwab. He's the um, executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. And he said that changes, and he's talking about these changes in our world, are so profound that from the perspective of human history, there's never been a time of greater promise or potential peril. Our decision makers are too often caught up in traditional, linear and non-disruptive thinking or too absorbed by immediate concerns to think strategically about the forces of disintermediation and innovation shaping our future. There's a lot of big words there, but I can sum it up like this. That's the way we've always done it. Just won't be enough. Right? We live in a world where we just, it's just not going to serve us unless we rethink a few things. In fact, Seymour Papert, one of my favourite educational thinkers, said it this way, we need to produce people who know how to act when they're faced with situations for which they were not specifically prepared. I can teach you nine how to pass the history test on Friday. I just tell them some stuff and they tell it back to me, right? But that's not going to solve the world's problems. We need students who can solve problems they've never seen before, right? And so, just to sum up, this is me. I took a flying lesson a little while ago. I've always wanted to fly. And um, I finally took a lesson. I'm probably not going to pursue it because it's too expensive. But it was fun. This is not me. <laughs> Can I have some sound on that one, please? Thank you. Oops. Where's his right wing? He just lost his wing. You've got to rethink a few things. 
When I took that flying lesson, before I did that flying lesson, we spent a lot of time talking about aerodynamics and how this, you know, the ailerons do this and the rudder does that and learning about all the control surfaces of the plane and, you know. You know what? When a wing falls off, that all changes quite dramatically. And the fact that a pilot can learn how to fly and then in an emergency unlearn all those things that are no longer helpful and then relearn a whole bunch of new things that are helpful, potentially life-saving, right? But I think that's where we are in education too. We've been doing a lot of things the same way for a long time, and some of them have served as well. But the changes that are coming through, not only technology, but the changes in the world and the changes in technology is the equivalent of the wings falling off. Right? And I think we need to now unlearn what are the things we do now that are no longer serving us. Let's unlearn those. And by the way, unlearn does not mean forget. So this doesn't mean forget some things, it means consciously unlearn some of the things we've learned and then consciously relearn some new things to replace those. So I think that's a really important skill. So just to sum up, imagine these possibilities, right? And then think about it. This, for the trapeze artist to grab the next bar, she has to let go of the previous one. And that moment when you're in the air and you've let go of the old stuff and you're floating towards the new one, and you're not there yet, I know that's a really scary moment, right? And some of you will feel like that today. Some of you will go out of this t this morning and you'll go, oh, I kind of, that guy made me really angry, but he's kind of right about a couple of things, <laughs> right? Um, and, and some of you will want to unlearn some things and relearn some new things, and that's how you're going to feel, that scary moment when you're between two worlds and you kind of, you don't know how to do the new world, but you kind of know you can't stay in the old world, right? But I just have this idea that, you know, if you're, you know, if, if you believe in the future, if you're, if you're a real educator, if you have the heart of an educator, how on earth can you not be inspired by the possibilities in front of you? So I'll leave you with that thought. Thanks very much.